Hi there, welcome to Zooming the Pandemic, the comics edition. This is a special that I've been doing for the Vancouver Comic Arts Festival, or VanCAF. This time around, I'm going to be talking to Roberta Gregory. Roberta's known for her iconic character, Bitchy Bitch, but as we will discover as I talk to her, Roberta has far more going on than just her iconic character of Bitchy Bitch. Do join us as we have an interesting and lengthy conversation about the joys and travails of being a comic book artist. Well, thank you so much for doing this, Roberta. It's oh, you bet. I was actually kind of pleased to see in some notes that you started off your career um, through Phil Yeh. Uh huh. And in fact, when I was talking to uh, Mary Fleener, she was saying that you guys were both going to Cal State Long Beach at the same time. Uh-huh, yeah. So I, I bet you you got stories about Phil. I mean, I shared an office with Phil. I know what character he was. Oh, he's he's energetic. I mean, he's got so many ideas. Like, he started a college paper. I think it was the second year I was there, Uncle Jam. It was like a humor paper. And I was in college, and I didn't have any art classes because they don't let you have them for a while so I was going crazy so I did like a series of Aesop's Fables illustrations in a sketchbook and he used one of them for the cover of the first Uncle Jam you know then I did strips so that was kind of fun because I had a creative I had a didn't ha, didn't have any art classes but I could do fun creative projects with Uncle Jam comic strips and illustrations and stuff and that was I think 1960 or 1972 I think Oof. Yeah, so Phil's been involved with a lot of people's early careers out in Southern mm -hmm. California. Because he always was in the middle of everything. Oh, yeah. Like, he got this little gallery down on 4th Street in Long Beach, a cobblestone gallery, and put out an arts paper interviewing people and, you know, reviews. I mean, just, yeah. Very good. He's very good at finding people that can do things and getting them to do things and, you know, like getting a, I mean, like his murals. I mean, he gets a whole bunch of people to do a mural. So, you know, he's very good at like organizing crowds. Some yeah. of us just work on our own and hope it's going to be good when we're done. But yeah. Phil kind of has that. Let's get everybody going energy, which is cool. He's like a circus master. Mm hmm. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, actually, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was zines, like, because I, I can remember zines when I first got into comics in the, in the mm -hmm. 70s, um, but you did zines for your family as a kid and continued to do them for a while from what I saw. Well, I don't know if I'd call them zines. I mean, basically, I would do art and staple them together and, you know, like, usually I'd show them to my dad and he'd, oh, that's cool and or whatever they said back in the, you know early 60s and you know I put a 50 cents so he'd buy it for me so that was <laughs> I mean I don't I don't have any of it because I think he bought them and put, did something with them and I never saw them again because he bought them you know but yeah so you were an entrepreneur even back then yeah I know I wish I wish I had I wish I had more of that energy now I'm kind of like now I'm kind of mentally, okay, I'm going to do something. If somebody wants to read it, that's fine. They know where to find me. I mean, I have like zero entrepreneurship anymore. I went to Cro Comics Crossroads in Columbus, Ohio, like two years, a couple of years ago. And, you know, they wanted comics. So I just sent two boxes full of books and such and thinking, well, fine, they have that. Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum, whatever doesn't sell, you know, I can donate to the museum, you know, that's, I don't have to haul it all back with me. And wouldn't you know, like everything sold out in about a day because nobody's seen me in Ohio. I mean, here on the West Coast, I'm over, you know. So maybe if I stay away from our shows, you know, but <laughs> that's why I'm kind of, I mean, I'll go to shows just because, you know, I like to travel and see people, but I kind of have no illusions about, you know, I might bring a couple of each book and I usually bring them back with me. So, yeah. So have you ever been up to VanCap up here in Vancouver? I don't think so. I think there was like a, there was some kind of a book fest that I was, I was at. It was, I think in the, it was in the library, I think, or something. This was probably about 15 or 20 years ago. I mean, it was a long time ago, but I remember some kind of a, Bookfest that had a comics 
you know, a comics um, section that, but I don't know if it was, I don't think it was specifically comics. So I don't think, I don't think I've been, I think there was, I think maybe back in the nineties, I might've gone to a couple of events in Vancouver. Um, I think I did a signing at the comic shop that was on fourth out in Kitsilano. I still remember that. I haven't been to Vancouver in probably at least 20 years. <laughs> Well, we'll have to have you up some year some when all time. the yeah. is done. You're not that far away. Once, once they'll let Americans travel again. <laughs> right now we're not letting any over the border. <laughs> oh, good. That's smart. Good for you. So I was reading a review that Publishers Weekly did uh, of your work. They called you one of comic movers, one of, one of comics women movers and shakers. Wow. So, when, when was that? Ah, you know. I don't. It's been a long time ago. No, but they they were looking at feminist comics and they were talking about oh. naughty bits and cool. um, how long you've been doing that. Did you mm -hmm. when you started doing bitchy bitch and naughty bitch? Yeah. Did you ever see yourself going this long? Oh no! I mean, it was like a joke. I mean, because all my everything I did was completely different. I mean, uh, I think the first bitchy story was in a short. Uh, what was it? Graphic Story Monthly. It was an anthology that Fanagraphics published, I think, in the late 80s and into the early 90s. And I did a story that was um, supposed to be not like something I would do. I mean, it was like the evil Roberta doing some ugly punk comic with this horrible character that hated everything and wanted to die and was miserable, like, you know, some of the artsy comics in the 80s were. And my stuff was always, like, nice. So... Um, and then I think, let's see, um, I was doing all this production work. I was working, started working at Fanagraphics when I moved up to Seattle, I actually moved with them. And, um, I was doing stats and old time, old timey production work, you know, cutting things and waxing them down and so forth. Um, I mean, I can't, I still can't do any, almost anything on a computer. I'm amazed I'm, I'm zooming, you know, <laughs> but, um, we're all learning. Yeah, I think Gary uh, said something about, oh, Roberta, maybe, maybe, maybe you'd like to do a comic for us. And I thought that's completely not like what I would do because all my stuff was, I was doing, what the hell was I doing? I did Winging It and Sheila and the Unicorn. And mm -hmm. I think I'd started Artistic Licentiousness, which was done in kind of a realistic style. And I thought, well, let's do this really off the wall, crazy. I think I was kind of inspired by Peter Bagg because he had these rubbery sort of two-dimensional characters. And boy, the shit hit the fan. I mean, when <laughs> that thing got published, it's like, so I thought, okay, this has to be a naughty bit. So, I mean, this has to go in something. And then I think I did another, did, I think did some other pages. And I think Gary wasn't crazy about one of the stories. So I thought, okay, well, how about my bitchy bitch character? Let's, let's have her go on the date from hell. And, you know, the first bitchy story is drawn in this horrible, you know, scribbly style. And it's full of profanity and so forth. And so I guess apparently it sold, sold better than they thought. So I think fanographics, I want you to do another one. So I think, okay, well, okay, what's, cause I'm kind of a novelist. I mean, I'm actually wor wor been working on a giant novel project for the last like 20 years. That's like 420,000 word books that I like to get done before I die. I <laughs> think just because it's, but you know, like I say, I'm kind of more of a novelist than a gag cartoonist. So I was thinking, okay, what's what kind of life did this person have to end up like this? So I think I did another did a story about her with dealing with her family and her workplace, and then I did a story about her as a child, and then you know, it just kind of started turning into something that was kind of going on. So I thought, oh, okay, this is fun. I can. You know what? Let, let's send her on vacation. Let's show her, you know, show show her in high school how to, you know, show her getting her first abortion, you know, so forth. So, you know, the novelist in me just found all these really fun things to kind of weave into the story. And forty issues later, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of comic books. That's a novel, Roberta. That is your novel. Well, there, oh yeah. <laughs> well, this well this is this this is completely different. But um. It's actually several because I've got these sort of long form stories. Like I've got the bitchy getting her abortion story. That was like three issues. I've got the bitchy in college story. I've got the bitchy on vacation story. And actually in the last, I think, from I think issue 24 to 
31, I think, I've got, did this like epic where she finally finds who she thinks is the perfect guy. And meanwhile, there's this other story of Marcy dealing with her, you know, mental wackiness. And that's probably about a, you know, probably about twice the size of one of my standard bitchy novels. So I'd like to get that collected somewhere because most of those comics are now all out of print. And it didn't, uh, like Life's a Bitch, that's the collection that Fanographics put out. There's supposed to be two volumes. That was volume one, the one with the red details on it. And I think I, I don't know if I even have a copy around. I think I've got a couple somewhere. But um, yeah, those, um, that was, that was going to be the complete bitchy bitch. And then Fanographics didn't think it sold as much as they wanted. So they canceled the Life's a Bitch part two. So I've got all kinds of bitchy stories that are, you know, kind of disappearing as the comics disappear. But there's uh, actually Fanographics, they've been talking to me about doing like a big bitchy book, like, you know, maybe the best of bitchy or whatever, because um, 2021, that's going to be, I think, the 30th anniversary of Naughty Bits, because the first issue was 19, 1991. Mm -hmm. So that might happen. It'd be a good time to do kind of a retrospect. I don't know. I mean, um, those comics all came out before the social media era. I mean, I, you know, I mean, the way I can just see somebody pulling out a panel and it going viral and look at what Bird is doing. She thinks, you know, all Asians are bad drivers or something. So I'm kind of, okay, you know, maybe when my career's going to be officially over, maybe, you know, this stuff can all go viral. But I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm kind of leery of it because of, just the way things are today. I mean, this is, yeah, you know, not, this is not the 90s. But, but Bitchy Bitch is a character that is so connected to you. I mean, if most people, when you talk to them who know your work, that's what they know. Mm -hmm. Do you uh -huh. feel that, that Midge is kind of your alter ego put on the page? Oh God, I hope not. I mean, I can't imagine Bitchy cranking out 40 issues of a comic book that nobody reads. Yeah, she's I mean, kind of like all the things you you aren't or or don't express. Well, she's all the well. She's basically, I guess, she would be me if I had like no self consciousness, no wow. like you know, no awareness, no. I mean, just everything with her is it's always something doing something to her. I mean, she kind of has no responsibility. But I mean, through the actually through the issue, she's kind of getting more and more like she gets little gets less prejudiced and. She's much less homophobic. I did a story and I think it was issues 20, what is it, 36 and 37, where she kind of gets over her homophobia, you know, so. And she's, she's sort of growing as a person. And I'd like to do, like, I have a, another one of my short, like, th three issue stories where she's dealing with having breast cancer because she's always been paranoid about that, you know. So I've kind of, started that so i'd like maybe that to be like the new content in the big bitchy book or whatever but i mean the way things are i mean everything's kind of getting delayed so i don't know when that's going to happen but i mean gary still sounds interested in it though so that's cool so this is the the new one are you going to so it's going to be a combination of old material and new material i have no i'm i'm assuming yeah i mean i'm thinking like i say we haven't really had the time to really discuss it much there's been so much else going on in my life. But, but Bitchy's also been, um, she's had, there's been stage shows. There's been, a, I, I remember seeing something about there was a cartoon. There's been quite a The animated time. cartoon, yeah. That's actually, um, well, that's kind of a long story too. That was like the early 2000s and this company, Cinemaria, which was in Montreal, um, they wanted to do episodes. They put them up on, I think they did several let's see it was like a used to run on uh there was like a little cartoon series of shorts on the oprah oprah network um and they did i think it was a couple of episodes of you know 23 minute long real episodes i mean they completely turned it into a sitcom i mean the only thing i wrote was the i was more the character designer and apparently they're up online somewhere. Like right before all of this happened, the producer, um, well, the producer actually passed away. I think her business partner contacted me and said they were going to, these were going to be up on 
up online and of course it's news to me and of course I'm not getting a penny for it you know so you know be through not having not a very good contract so I haven't really followed it up but I guess I should I mean just so people can see them I don't know if they have to subscribe to something or whatever but uh, apparently life's a bitch is now the cartoons are now somewhere online I love that <laughs> yeah actually, there's, I actually have two of them let's see um they are actually two that are in their packages. I mean, this oh, cool. was eight. Let's see. 1995, Harry Harry Toys, which was, I think, Flower Frankenstein's little um, toy making company in San Francisco. Let's see. There's, here's, um, she's like a little doll. I actually have a bunch of uh, these fabric that are printed up so somebody could actually cut them out and sew them together if they were inclined to sew. And um, project. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. She's got That's boobs nice. and she bends. You can just do all kinds of things. And the little package, which people are like wanting me to sell them, and I just, I mean, it's only two, but there's a little booklet. There's a squeaky cucumber. <laughs> yeah. That I got from Archie McPhee. You know, there's, it's adorable. There's little bitchy anger lines on the, then there's a little story on the back so oh, there's yeah i've actually got two of these yeah 1999 and this one is signed because it actually somebody won it and then when he moved he gave it back to me which was nice so this is like the one that i never got to sell so you know anyway but yeah she have actually been doing merch oh, i've been kind of prioritizing i mean one of my big pri priorities has been like finishing the novel i mean every time i get some time i just sit down with, you know like put in you know write. so that's one of that's kind of my big creative prayer plus i'm also doing short things i've been asked to there's lots of um anthologies that i've been putting material in i think this um oh i'm drawing a blank but the um the one that's up for a i think an eisner the or drawing power. Yeah, Mary Fleener was yeah, talking about it too. She's in that. Yeah, drawing power. Okay, yeah, it's like, this. it's great. Yeah. So, I mean, in that, and then there's like an environmental comic I'm trying to do a story for. So, you know, I, I, I've been doing short stories. And then, you know, I've got my cat book and my travel book that I published in, I think the travel book was 2010, uh, Follow Your Art. And I wanted to ask you about that because that looks really interesting. Oh, it is. Let's see. I've got the downside is there's, uh, this is one of my sample copies. I have very few left because it was published by a publisher that's like out of business and um, well, third place press, but it's basically a collection of all my, some of my travel stories that were in Naughty Bits as backup stories, some of some sor travel stories I've drawn um i think since then i actually drew a lot of train travel stories because bruce and i tra traveled onto the train a lot so there's little illustrated stories and i've got about 30 other pages that i've drawn since i published it self-published it and like i say i think about maybe 200 people have actually seen it so if i had more computer skills i could put them up online on a blog or something you know but yeah so that's uh i might put them up i might put the um, travel the new travel stories up on patreon i've got a patreon i've kind of started and kind of neglected and what else oh true cat tunes i have that one that that came out in 2014 because i was collecting people's cat stories and just wanted to get them in print so i did a print on demand version of that and maybe sold about 400 of those maybe uh, and yeah i so does print on, print on demand work for you? Does it help you kind of get your work out there? Oh, not really. I mean, the stories are, are the books are so expensive per copy. It isn't really worth, you know, getting, putting in a bookstore at a bookstore discount. I mean, I think the, but true cat tunes, I mean, it's, you know, that sells for like 13, $13. And I think they're like $6 each to, well, it was done by Lulu because um, the person that was helping me used Lulu and, you know, it's something like five or six dollars. So, you know, once you once it goes into a bookstore, you know, if they sell it, you'll get maybe a dollar from it. So it's not worth it. So and, you know, I don't have that many left either. So I'm not really flogging it that much. But it's very nice. I mean, it's got, you know, if you like cats and then I always do like a color cat drawing 
in the front of it and they they kind of do okay at um comic shows i mean if somebody likes cats they'll pick one up but like i say i'm kind of you know i'm kind of cynical cynical about how well my stuff sells apparently um bitchy bitch was published in china i mean fanographics yeah i think i've even got one. Oh yeah i've got Here's a bitches born in Chinese that Fanographics sent me um, several months ago, and I have no idea if these are selling either, but, you know, she's, bitchy is in China. <laughs> so maybe it's just a matter of getting it to enough places. I think so, yeah. Well, um, there was also something, an, an anthology that you did in 2006 called Sexy Chicks. You did a story called Camellia. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, about a, it's a about a girl that's always what other people want her to be, like a chameleon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. fun. Kind of a really different kind of story for for you, and very different again from Midge and from what you do. Uh -huh. with well, it's kind of like my other the other stories I do. It's kind of like kind of like artistic licentiousness. You know, it's kind of like winging it. I do sort of have a kind of surreal, realistic form comics that I sort of do, but nobody ever sees them, I mean. But um, yeah, that was, it's fun. I just like, I mean, I like doing different kinds of stories. I mean, I can't imagine having like a newspaper strip where you have to draw Nancy over and over and over again for like decades. I mean, I'd go crazy. I've been like writing like crazy. I mean, like I say, I've, um, probably done, written about 70,000 more words in the novel, book three, which I hope to finish sometime this month. And then I'm probably going to be going on to some other projects, like I'll talk to Fanographics. And there's also a small publisher in town that's been interested in a collection of all my, like, completely out of print, like all my old gay comic stories and stories from the 70s that were obscurely published and I just kind of haven't had the time to really deal with them right now. I'm not sure if they're still interested or not, but you know, that's another possible project. So there's, I mean, there's potentially a lot going on, but um, I've been kind of overwhelmed with like my own sort of health issues and then family issues and such, you know, but yeah, but I've got, I've got plans. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny, but I, a lot of people I'm talking to are saying that pandemic has actually cleared the decks for them to get to the projects they wanted to do. Mm hmm. Oh yeah, like the writing. Like I thought. I mean, I've got two books that are each like about 130,000 words. In words, and it pretty much took me 20 years to get that far, and I'm just like kind of doing the math, going, I'm never, you know, this, you know, and now I'm almost finished with book three, so that's really exciting. So. That was kind of my, and I've got a 100-page um, webcomic that's a prequel that I would love to draw. I mean, it's a prequel to the giant storyline that's going on in all these books, but I don't know if I'll ever get to it, but that's written. That's another possibility. I just have to learn how to put stuff on the web. Or, or find somebody who... Oh, I've been, I've been, trying, I'm, I've, I've been trying to find people for years. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Well, yeah. we'll put the word out. Who knows? Word out. Yes, word out. Roberta, Roberta Peck help. She'll pay. I will pay, actually. Yeah. So what do you say, fans of Roberta Gregory? Let me know. You want to come help her get something up on the web? This is the way to do it. Thank you. <laughs> you never know. Yep. So so you got, it sounds like you got a lot of stuff in the works. Either writing oh, it or planning it or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Story of life. I mean. You know, it's like everything is like the tip of the iceberg. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the pandemic has done a lot of things that have been destructive. There's been done, done a lot of things that have been good. What do you think is going to come out of it that's going to be positive for the world? Well, I'm, I would like to hope that people are going to have a different perspective about what's important in life. I mean, what really matters. I mean, if... Um, the human, you know, my ideal, ideal, or person that likes to idealize would like to think that the human race is going to 
um, emerge with a new sense of what's important and what matters and um, put pettiness aside, but kind of seeing what's going on in the U.S. right now. I'm not really sure if that's going to happen. But um, right now, I just like to get see Trump get kicked out of office. If, you know, him screwing this up, you know, majestically is going to get deter a few people that might have voted for him. Otherwise, I mean, I would be happy with that right now. But yeah, it's a, it's a mess. I mean, it's, I can't, I really can't even look at the news anymore. I kind of stopped sharing news on Facebook. If I, you know, it's like, now I put up cat videos. I think a lot of us are putting up cat videos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So any other projects that you're working on now that you want to let people know about? Uh, not really. Like I say, there's my Big Mother Mountain project. It's a spinoff of one of the backstories in my Winging at Graphic novel from like the 80s and 90s. And um, I'd like to it's really fun. I like I really like writing. I mean, it's um, like an entire epic. Like I say, it's four books. I'm coming into the home stretch on three. They're all like about 130,000 words, and they've been writers workshopped lots of times and. I don't know if anybody's, I'm probably going to have to publish it myself, you know, but you know, that's, I'm excited, I'm, I'm excited getting that done. And then also, like I say, I have a hundred page webcomic prequel that I would love to draw. Let's see what else. Um, I've always wanted to draw or put together a how to draw cats book. Cause I've got more people want me to do the cat tunes there. There's a website, true cat tunes, which you can probably link to that has some samples, but I wrote a book on how to draw cats for people that like cats and don't think they can draw and God knows if it'll ever see print, but it's, it's written. So I'm kind of the queen of all these projects that people may, may or may not see, you know, while I'm, <laughs> depending on how long I last, but <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got short stories I'd like to draw. Let's see. I've got about three or four, maybe 10 page comic stories that are, completely different things I'd like to like to work on. I like to just draw. I'd like to get back into like artwork. I mean, for a while, if you go to my Facebook page, you can, every so often there'll be little bunches of animal drawings I'm doing, you know? So yeah, I just kind of want to get back into being a creative person, which I'm pretty much kind of, I mean, there's a few roadblocks when things happen that have to be addressed ASAP, but I'm, ac I'm actually kind of happy with the, I mean, I kind of miss going places and I'm sort of the person that goes out and shops for my high risk household. But, um, you know, I'm actually kind of happy to stay home and work. <laughs> so in a dream situation, say money was no object, you could work with anybody you wanted, you could do any kind of project and it would get published. Is there anything that comes to mind to you about what you think you would like to do? Well, I would, I would just like to do whatever comes into my little head and have somebody want to publish it. That would be awesome. I mean, just the time to time to squirrel myself away and just kind of work on projects and go out and take a walk by the ocean, which is where I would be living, and then come back in after having tea with my friends and work work into the wee hours and then have a publisher that's, oh, Roberta, are you done? Oh, here. Oh, that's awesome. You know, it's we'll put it out next year and I would be so delighted. So that would be my, that would be my dream. Well, I've got stuff I want to get out of my, my head and onto paper or onto the screen so somebody else can see it and make room for more. Wow. You have to know there are more stories that Roberta Gregory has to tell than we can possibly imagine. And who knows, maybe someone watching this is going to be able to help her get those out on the web. Next episode is our last episode in this series. I'm going to be talking to Vancouver Island's own Joan Stacy, who writes some very personal graphic novels that I love, and this is the reason why I wanted to talk to her. Do join us when Joan and I sit down and have a lovely chat. See you then.